Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening um, from whatever corner of the world you are joining us today. Welcome to the third edition of our joint webinar with UNCTAD and UNITAR. And um, today, uh, giving our opening um, remarks will be the director of UNCTAD, um, and her name is Ms. Tatiana Krilova. Welcome. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for giving me the floor. Uh, this, uh, dear Ms. Maya, uh, dear distinguished panelists, uh, dear participants and colleagues, my name is Tatiana Krilova. I'm head of Enterprise Branch at the United Nations Conference on Trade and Development. It's uh, really my pleasure to be here today and welcome you to our third event in the series of monthly webinars uh, titled The Role of Entrepreneurship in Post-COVID-19 Resurgence that we have uh, launched uh, jointly with UNITAR in September 2020 in response uh, to the challenges posed by COVID-19 for entrepreneurs and micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, MSMEs. Uh, we all are well aware of the role that MSME sector plays in economies in member states, employing more than two thirds of the global uh, population. We also are well aware how hard it is hit by the pandemic. In this context, we need to make further concerted efforts to raise awareness of the critical role that the SME sector has in uh, post-COVID-19, social and economic recovery, implementation of sustainable development goals, and what really needs to be done to make it happen. The series of these webinars is part of the United Nations project titled Global Initiative Towards Post-COVID-19 Resurgence of the MSME Sector within the UN framework for the immediate social economic response to COVID-19. The framework consists of five streams of work, an integrated support package offered by the United Nations development system to protect the needs and rights of people living under the duress of the pandemic with particular focus on the most vulnerable countries, groups and people who risk being left behind. One of its uh, core five streams uh, of this framework uh, uh, is protecting jobs, supporting small and medium-sized enterprises, and informal sector workers. We call it uh, the nickname, the short name of the project is a MSME Search Project. It aims to facilitate the role and contribution of entrepreneurship and MSMEs into resilient, inclusive, and green recovery of economies in post-COVID-19 uh, times. The project is led by UNCTAD and implemented in cooperation with the UN Regional Commissions and DESA in New York. So the focus of the webinar today is resilience. What is resilience? Uh, I looked at the Wikipedia and the definition there is the ability uh, to respond, absorb and adapt to, as well as recover in a disruptive event. A resilient structure is expected to be able to resist to an extreme event uh, with minimal damages and functionality disruptions during the event. And after the event, it should be able to rapidly recover uh, its functionality similar to or even better than uh, in the pre-event level. So resilience means an ability not only to protect entrepreneurs and their businesses, but also to mitigate uncertainties to be able to recover quickly, which is of course a cornerstone of any business competitiveness. Uh, it means uh, resilience. It means uh, developing strategy, uh, strategies and new business models that would enable MSMEs not just manage specific scenarios, but to create agility and flexibility to cope with turbulent situations, to manage spectrum of risks, not just high impact disasters like COVID-19. Realization of the need to develop such resilience is increasingly important for MSMEs to be able to survive, adapt, evolve, and grow in the face of change. Starting and growing a business is not only an inspiring endeavor, but also a never ending path of setbacks, challenges, and potential roadblocks, uh, roadblocks uh, from start to finish. The key elements uh, for running a successful business uh, are knowledge, skills, experience, access to finance, innovation and technology. And of course, the business needs to uh, operate in a regulatory environment that enables, enables it rather than imposes unnecessary barriers and burdens. Also critical as demonstrated by UNCTAD flagship program called Empratec in more than 40 countries, uh, which is based on behavioral approach on boosting entrepreneurship motivation and success. Uh, it requires a mindset that entrepreneurs need to possess to allow them to survive and grow 
identify new opportunities, including in such difficult times that we all are facing today. And the, and the pandemic indeed, as any other crisis, presents such new opportunities to open new doors, make new decisions and work differently. In this regard, I am very pleased and proud to highlight that Jungstad continues its efforts towards enabling all key stakeholders, including policymakers on the one hand and entrepreneurs on the other hand, to enhance their MSME resilience, their survival and growth, particularly with regard to most vulnerable groups of population. This includes development of number of new online tools and scaling up our ongoing activities thanks to, uh, to new uh, digitaliz uh, digitalization opportunities also offered uh, by uh, these uh, uh, times of uh, pandemic. To, uh, to enhance the role of entrepreneurship and addressing issues of migration, just yesterday, UNCTAD, in partnership with the UNITAR, IOM, and UNC uh, UNHCR, uh, in a virtual forum, launched the Spanish version of the massive online uh, open course entitled Capacity Building for Entrepreneurs for Entrepreneurship uh, for Migrants and Refugees under the auspices of the Global Forum on Migration and Development and with the participation of the French of the Forum. The course is built on the policy guide uh, previously developed by UNCTAD, UNHCR and IOM and uh, until now it was uh, the online training course was available uh, only in English now it's available in uh, Spanish and we're also looking towards development, uh, developing it in uh, French and Arabic. Another recent example is the seventh edition of the Empratec Women in Business Award, which uh, since its launch in uh, 2008 is aimed at raising awareness and empowering women entrepreneurship. This year it is uh, dedicated, also dedicated to the theme of resilience. COVID-19 pandemic has a strong negative impact on women entrepreneurs, given their overrepresentation in sectors particularly affected by lockdowns, uh, uh, that is uh, retail trade, hotels and restaurants and education, in addition to long existing structural inequalities, including limited access to finance, technology, markets, networks and social protection, as well as uh, informality. So the, uh, this uh, initiative, Women in Business Award, will be held virtually uh, on Thursday, December 10, to recognize the contribution of inspiring women entrepreneurs trained by the Empratec program and to celebrate their success uh, in the world of business. On this occasion, I would like to use this opportunity to invite all of you to join the event. Uh, it will be uh, shortly posted on the UNCTAD website uh, in terms of how to access uh, the, uh, how to participate in, uh, in this event. So ladies and gentlemen, for many businesses, the situation would look very different in uh, six months time uh, or even now as they are being pushed to adapt to new normal never experienced before. So how can entrepreneurs reframe their organizations to make their businesses more resilient? What tools uh, enable them to adapt when everything around them has changed? How they can manage new risks and uncertainties? The answers to these questions uh, should inform other entrepreneurs about business opportunities around them and how to tap those. And also the ways governments could support the private sector in general and during this, particular, uh, this uh, pandemic in particular. So we uh, sincerely hope that this series of webinars and the one that we are conducting today will help uh, to inspire entrepreneurs to start innovative and resilient ventures based on inclusive, circular and sustainable business models that would aim to positive social environment and economic impacts, and again, facilitate and enhance uh, the uh, uh, post-COVID-19 uh, resurgence. Uh, I would like to thank UNITAR for excellent collaboration on this initiative, and actually more generally, because we have a number of products that we're developing together. And I also would like to thank all panelists for their time and availability, uh, uh, all those who actually take part uh, in this uh, uh, important event, and I wish all participants a useful and productive discussions. And uh, thank you very much for your attention, and we look forward to um, further discussions today and our further interaction uh, in further webinars that will be conducted in coming months. Thank you very much. Thank you, Director Kilova. It's always a pleasure uh, for us to interact with UNTA. Um, I will take over now and then I will give the floor back um, to my colleague, Julia Genf, um, who is uh, uh, actually helping us uh, with the flow. 
Um, my name is Alex Mejia, I'm the Director of the Division for People and Social Inclusion at UNITAR, the United Nations Agency in charge of training and research. And um, it would be my great privilege to give you a short overview, perhaps, you know, of the COVID so far, so we can put all what we are going to discuss under that light, because it is difficult to ignore. And then, very briefly, um, uh, to, for, uh, to echo a little uh, the, the, the correct words uh, from Tatiana on um, resilience and resurgence and entrepreneurship uh, per se. So Julia, if you can help me, um, uh, give me the first slide. Um, as of yesterday, and this is from our colleagues uh, here in Geneva, WHO, the World Health Organization, uh, the authorized source, I believe, for, for the statistics, 59, 55, excuse me, million uh, confirmed cases and 1,333,742 deaths. And I, I wanted to read the number in full because all of these um, uh, deaths are a drama, are painful, uh, families behind, uh, children left behind, and especially the loss of uh, valuable members of our communities, uh, very many of them entrepreneurs. Uh, so uh, I, I just want to remember, and we were saying that, that yesterday as well in the launch uh, of, of a course in Spanish, a joint course with UNTA, ILO, uh, um, excuse me, uh, I am uh, uh, the International Migration Organization uh, and um, UNHCR. We were saying yesterday that all of these numbers are also lost potential. And it's a very sad because um, uh, society um, thrives on the concourse of, of everyone. And uh, if we keep uh, the coronavirus ahead until a vaccine is actually uh, adopted, discovered, adopted and distributed, um, we are going to see more numbers like this, unfortunately. Next, please. If you look at the numbers uh, by uh, regions, um, it's um, very sad to see uh, that is improving, of course, but Europe was particularly hit uh, as well as the Americas. Uh, but you see the numbers there. I simply wanted to uh, disaggregate them a little so you can see how definitely we are in a second wave when we thought in March or April, that you remember that, that the coronavirus crisis, the pandemic will be a matter of two months, maybe four months, the summer, the European summer will come and we will forget about it. We, we cannot forget about it. And, and we will continue to strive and, and, and to, um, be challenged by this, but again, we must remain optimistic. Uh, next, next, please. Now, in this light, entrepreneurship um, is important to highlight, and I will also echo some of the words that uh, Tatiana has uh, given um, in her introductory remarks. The coronavirus outbreak has caused a global health emergency indeed, but also a global economic slowdown among other consequences. Trade, investment, growth, and employment are all affected and the crisis will have an impact on the achievement of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. We wanted to uh, include this here, just to remind you that this global quest that started, uh, it was adopted, the Agenda 2030 for Sustainable Development adopted in uh, September 2015. It's a roadmap from the beginning of 2016 until the end of 2030 to fight poverty to make our nations better, to increase the standard of living, to reduce discrimination, to protect the environment, to ensure a proper access to health and education of quality and so on. All of that is being also challenged by the COVID. Um, we all know and we read the news that um, most governments, rich or, or, or in developing countries, have diverted uh, resources, valuable resources were then dedicated to the achievement of the sustainable development goals, to the fight of the pandemic, to public health matters, and, 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 and reasonably uh, uh, it's the right thing to do, but we must not uh, forget uh, this quest to make our world better. So that's why it is here, and um, we do recognize the impact on the achievement of the uh, SDGs, but um, uh, as our Secretary General said, when, whenever we come back, I hope sooner than, than later, early next year, um, uh, to our, our new normal, we should build back better. That's important, that we don't repeat the, the mistakes of the past. Anyway, um, the situation has become even worse in developing countries. I come from Ecuador in South America, and I can attest to that, uh, where the stability or growth uh, for startups and SMEs has been significantly in danger. Um, we had discussed in one of the previous webinars that Tatiana mentioned, the access to cash 
that uh, micro small and medium enterprises will have. And it's shocking uh, to see that the vast majority of um, SMSEs uh, in um, developing nations mainly uh, have uh, only two months of cash. I'm, I'm not exaggerating. You can Google this information is public. Uh, the World Bank uh, and UNTA, um, uh, published some of these things and are good indicators to understand the vulnerability of MSMEs. Every business that has been forced to close leads to multiple stories of unemployment, economic and social dislocation, as well as staggering uncertainty. It remains paramount that governments in partnership with different stakeholders, civil society as a whole, dedicate their support to drive competitiveness of micro, small and medium-sized enterprises with a particular focus on those small businesses in developing countries, as I just say. Um, the picture to the right, uh, there is something missing there, but our colleagues at the ITC and the World Bank were uh, explaining the type of environment that uh, poor people are facing uh, during the COVID. Um, increased poverty, increased unemployment, increased poverty, uh, reduced access uh, to public services. Uh, and they postulate that as many as two thirds of the world's poorest people could live in such environments in a continued manner. And that's why this uh, picture is there to the right of the slide, to say that the very many people that have emerged out of poverty once back, not necessarily go, go, go back to be uh, middle class or, or, or to increase income immediately. It's a pity. Next, please. Um, here on labor statistics, our colleagues at ILO, we thought important to see this, uh, uh, to set the, the frame, uh, the framework for this discussion as uh, Tatiana also did. It's important to see these numbers uh, uh, from the International Labor Organization. 94% of uh, people employed in countries uh, see workplace closures. 17.3% have seen a decline in working hours. And this is a number that continues to shock me. And this is by June the 30th. Uh, and now it should be even worse with the second wave that we are going through. $3.5 trillion uh, have been lost uh, from the global labor uh, income. Um, a very uh, dire and um, uh, negative scenario and outlook, but we must remain optimistic because resilience, and I go back to the topic um, that we will explore today, is what makes humanity strive and go forward uh, uh, to what makes an individual that has seen uh, uh, even closure of a micro, small, or, 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 or a medium enterprise to try again and to go back at it. Next, please. To conclude, um, I wanted to also um, uh, tell you, uh, thank you Tatiana for mentioning this in passing, that um, we have this uh, excellent course, if I may say, on entrepreneurship for migrants and refugees that actually empowers people that have been developed with the guidance and support of UNTA. We are unit that are privileged to have this partnership um, uh, that we uh, uh, admire very much. And um, this comes out of a, a very most, uh, a very valuable, uh, the most uh, relevant uh, guide um, uh, pub publication with uh, even 36, I think it is, uh, practical cases to analyze on uh, examples of uh, entrepreneurship that was published by IOM, uh, UNHCR, and uh, on that, as I mentioned before. This is a good example of what uh, further steps can be uh, taken towards resilience for entrepreneurs and um, MSMEs. Uh, through capacity building. So even if you are listening today, and thank you to the 200 of you listening for very many countries, I saw the statistics of the uh, people registered and this only humbles us. If you are listening today and you are an entrepreneur facing challenges, empower yourself with these materials. Go and take these courses, they are free. Uh, simply uh, go to unitar.org or to contact.org and you will see them. And, and for those of you that speak Spanish, I was very privileged uh, to launch this course um, uh, with some other uh, partners yesterday, now also in Spanish, and we will go to other languages soon. Uh, next, please, Julia, and I believe um, we have um, uh, concluded. And I thank again, uh, Tatiana, you and your team, and UNTAD as a whole, uh, for empowering UNITAR also to make a difference when it comes to entrepreneurship and to support uh, resilience, as you described. Thank you so much. Back to you, Julia. Thank you so very much, Alex, um, and also Ms. Krilova for your wonderful uh, welcoming and opening remarks um, that indeed are very valuable. So um, today, uh, next we will now um, give the floor to our panelists. And uh, first up is Ms. Maria Elo, 
She's an associate professor at the University of Southern Denmark, a professor at Shanghai University, an adjunct professor at Abo Academy University, Migration Fellow, Institute of Migration, and founder and leader of the Diaspora Networks and International Business Platform. With that great profile and wonderful um, track record, we very much look forward to hearing you speak. Welcome and I, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, so first of all, ladies and then gentlemen, good afternoon or good morning, good evening. Um, so as said, uh, my name is Maria Elo. I would really like to start directly discussing the topic. So let's look at entrepreneurial strategies, resilience and mobility. When we look at, um, when we look at uh, entrepreneurship and entrepreneurs, we are specifically interested in, in why are they so strategic? They are so strategic because they generate jobs, economic growth, social inclusion and business transformation. They are the key pillar in our economy. They make a large number of the businesses, they employ a lot of people. They are also very central in creating sustainable digital economy. They are forming industrial entrepreneurial ecosystems, developing that resilience that we need for the external shocks. They also enable different type of people from all backgrounds to be inclusively participating in economy. They are very much innovative in developing different, different business models that can be scaled up and even in those peripheral contexts. However, we still have issues with gender gap, low youth entrepreneurship and other problems. But what is really important is that entrepreneurs are carrying notable economic, environmental and social responsibilities. So very much in line with the SDGs, but also the business risks. So what kind of a safety net does the society offer to entrepreneurs in exchange? Next, please. So if we look at the institutional framings, where are these entrepreneurs embedded in? So first of all, we have entrepreneurs that can be formal, registered or informal, irregular ones. Typically, our societies are looking at the formal ones, ignoring the dual nature of the entrepreneurial domain. The formal ones are embedded in these formal institutions. Uh, here, we need well-functioning, legitimate, trusted formal institutions that are very important and can be a location choice factor, by the way. We also have the need for inclusive formal safety nets for entrepreneurs, for illness, uh, external shocks, all kinds of things has, has been mentioned. These can be, for example, safety nets, can, can be about uh, short-term economic financial assistance, but also agile regulation is important, reduction of uncertainty with transparent planning and guidelines. But also this kind of atmosphere, is the atmosphere welcoming for entrepreneurship, for prosperity, failure, origin, different types of business, are they safe? Now, if we go to the informal side, we also have another layer of embeddedness, and that is in the global interconnected embeddedness, informal institutions, social networks. We have global migrant diaspora networks that are people-centered. We also have embeddedness in diverse and different ethnic, religious, family, knowledge, uh, entrepreneurial configurations that can be really meaningful uh, platforms. Uh, and here, what is interesting, these informal, connected embeddedness that entrepreneurs are in. They empower all kinds of inclusion forms, also for the informal ones, often having resilient and transnationally responsible structures. So perhaps can we learn how to better encounter and anticipate this kind of connected and confined changes, for example, crises for business from that global informal institutional embeddedness? Next one, please. So if we look at the entrepreneurs and their strategies in facing the reality, as mentioned earlier already, uh, they have different challenges, but they are also focusing on arbitrage and innovation opportunities. So they are often opportunity driven. So how do they form their logics and strategies in, in acting as entrepreneurs? Typically we have causation, we have planning, and this is what most of the business studies are, 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 are educating, you know, planning proper uh, systems. We also have effectuation that suggests that we have co-creation processes, networks, taking it a little bit differently. 
Now, what is really interesting in this era is bricolage and improvisation, making do with current resources, creating new forms and order from tools and materials at hand. Where we look at the category that, for example, the most disadvantaged uh, people like refugee entrepreneurs are using in order to address those arbitrage and innovation opportunities. So perhaps when planning and reality do not match, are there other ways of developing business? Should we turn somehow the lenses around? Next one, please. Now, if we look at the entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs of all kinds, whether migrant or non-migrants, are creating value creation. This is, this is the, the essence of business for different purposes. It can be based on heritage. It can be based on, on some kind of uh, location-specific business models. It can be thousands of years uh, resilient basic business, not so extremely innovative, but really innovative. So different formats. Next one, please. Now, we already had an interesting viewpoint to resilience, but when we look at specifically entrepreneurial resilience, it can be a, a tool for surviving throughout the crisis, during the crisis, or also a tool for thriving. So if we turn the lens around and learn resilience from migrant entrepreneurs, that might be a, a choice. Because migrant entrepreneurs, they have survived crises, conflicts, diverse challenges. They have done different transformations uh, for their lives. So they have businesses unusual. They are responding to opportunities, risk taking, having a kind of a survival plus. They are typically having a, a, a flexible model on the go, and they have a lot of learning developed. So untapped experiential knowledge. So perhaps we could have bottom up experts on resilience as mentors for SMEs and entrepreneurial education training. Next one. For example, forced migrants, refugees, they can become international entrepreneurs, investors, capacity builders, like we have the Bukharian Jewish diaspora or the Korean diaspora in Central Asia, host and homeland uh, connections, very important. Next one. Now, if we look at that mobility, that's one of the keys. We have different instruments. Entrepreneurial mobility is really interesting. We need entrepreneur specific policies. We need risk sharing and funding systems, information learning systems. We can employ better instruments of diaspora networks and experience. Also uh, heritage, location specific issues, uh, technology issues like blockchain traceability, stickiness of capital, those dollars with love. So a really purpose-driven behavior, empowering global helix as we're looking at our special issue, looking at the African potential. But the last very important question that I think we have to look at is, if we look at international entrepreneurial flexibility and circularity, which is a great potential, we are lacking views looking at that entrepreneurship light. Uh, so those not black and white formations, but those empowering structures, how can we do things in that post-COVID era to empower that untapped potential that is there, perhaps distributed, perhaps dispersed? So thank you very much for your attention, and I look forward to the discussions. Thank you very much, Ms. Elo. It was an absolute pleasure listening to you. And um, without further ado, I would like to ask our next panelist um, to the floor, Mr. Olivier Bastien. He's the chairman and CEO of the Seychelles Chamber of Commerce. Um, with this, I welcome you to the floor. Thank you very much. Um, good afternoon, um, everyone. Um, uh, I hope everyone's doing well. Um, my name is um, Oliver Bastien, um, and I am the chairman of the Seychelles Chamber of Commerce and, and Industry. Um, uh, my profession is actually, I, I, I run a professional service firm. I, I do the chairmanship as a voluntary role. Um, I am a chartered accountant by, by trade. Um, so um, firstly, I guess I would like to to thank the, the organizers, uh, UNCTAD and UNITA, um, uh, for putting together this webinar, uh, which I think um, for the, the Chamber of Commerce, the STCI as we, we are known, to really pre present its perspective uh, on the, what we what, what is termed resilient entrepreneurship and the MSME resurgent. I think it's, um, um, if we stick to the first slide, sorry, not, not quite yet. Um, I think um, if, um, if we really look um, at 
what we're talking about. I mean, from our perspective, it is critical and, and fundamentally important um, for there to be this dialogue, for there, for there to be this sharing amongst colleagues, among friends, among nations, because I, I do believe that it's important that we can all learn from each other and where we can effectively start looking at how we, we develop new models, um, we refine models, um, and to really kind of adapt into our own jurisdiction. And I think that's, that's really, really important. So again, I'm, I'm, I'm really excited and, and extremely happy that um, uh, we, we can participate and we can effectively share in terms of our input. Um, uh, um, from the perspective of the SCCI, we are the biggest private sector organization here in Seychelles. Um, we have members from different sectors and, and also from um, of different sizes. And uh, I think, um, I believe that, um, um, uh, forgive me if I get the name wrong, um, Mr. Magia, um, when he was citing the numbers um, earlier, in terms of 55.3 million um, in terms of cases and 1.3 million deaths. I think these are alarming numbers and they are, they are really sad to hear um, where we are. And really it contributes to what I believe was termed as loss opportunities. And um, the impact on, of COVID, I think we all know it has been extremely, extremely challenging on MSMEs and entrepreneurs. I mean, the recent survey that we did here in Seychelles, the, the SCCI did, you know, it, it really showed uh, amongst all businesses uh, in Seychelles that really the MSMEs were struggling extensively. And, 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 and for that, when we, from the survey data, when we did strip out in terms of the tourism um, and tourism related services um, businesses, and we look at the other sectors, we, we could see that effectively you, there was more or less a drop in productivity um, between approximately 35 to 40%, uh, which is, um, as majority of um, you entrepreneurs will, will know, it's a massive dent in your profitability, a massive dent in your liquidity and in and, and your capital reserves that you have. So, um, um, you know, it, it, it is alarming. And, and, and this is why these kind of webinar sessions are really important. And, um, and I think that the previous speaker, uh, Ms. Maria, was, was, was mentioning with regard to the importance of MSMEs. And from the Seychelles perspective, when we look at the contribution of the MSMEs, number one, they formulate over 95% of businesses in Seychelles. Number two, they contribute up between 17 to 20% of our GDP and 41% with regards to um, overall employment. So it, it, it definitely shows and confirms um, what the previous speaker was saying again, from that it shows the, the importance of, if I can term it for the time being, this amazing group of, um, uh, of businesses, the MSMEs. And this is why it's important that, you know, um, policymakers, uh, multinational bodies, um, like UMTAD, like UNITA, um, really kind of zooms in and look at how we can support MSMEs moving forward. Well, and, and I think like it was, uh, again, like one of the previous speakers was mentioning, um, um, which regards to how to respond, how to absorb, how to adapt, and how to recover. So I, I do believe that um, this is fundamental. Um, before we, we go on to talk about the model that we've more or less um, adapted here in Seychelles and, and how we've more or less uh, contributed to the various initiatives and, um, uh, with regards to resilience, um, I think it's important to look at Seychelles in context. Um, so if you can allow me to maybe um, give you a quick overview of, of Seychelles, um, uh, not in terms of the, the, the sunny beaches uh, and the um, uh, the beautiful islands, but uh, today we talk a little bit about in terms of economics. Um, so um, at the moment, um, I, and I believe that um, even the IMF report depicts that the recovery in Seychelles will pretty much be uh, an L-shaped recovery. Um, I think as many of you would guess that our main, our main sector or our main industry is tourism. 
Um, here, um, uh, as you can see from uh, the table uh, on, the, uh, on your right or on your left, um, tourism contributes around 24.4% uh, towards GDP, but do not um, be misguided because be um, the fact that because it's our main pillar, everything else uh, is um, pretty, much, um, uh, pretty much kind of interlink. So um, it is important that um, you, do, um, you do bring this into context. And, and when you look at the various economic indicators that we, we, we um, um, off Seychelles, we can see that effectively there's a significant uh, decline um, with regards to our earnings, our GDP, um, our tourist arrival number, and effectively inflation rates starting to, to, to more or less prop up, unemployment rates going up. So, Effectively, it's not a pretty picture for the country. So next slide, please. So um, uh, here I, I, will, I would have to obviously skate um, through it very quickly, but I, I do feel that it was important to, 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 to show with regards to what are the key components um, with regards to enhancing resilience um, as uh, MSMEs or as entrepreneurs. Um, and as business owners, and and effectively, this is what we we use to to develop in terms of various kind of intervention with government. This is what we use to, to talk to our members, but also this is what we use to guide policymakers to ensure that when they are formulating um, policies or fiscal measures, to zoom in towards understanding these various components. So very quickly, um, employee health and well-being. Um, here, it's obviously fundamental that, um, uh, you know, there is um, appropriate, um, I guess, protocols around public health, around health and safety, especially if your organization or workplace requires a physical return of your employees. So looking at their health and well-being is fundamental. Um, and, and, and it is important to get that right um, to ensure that effectively your workforce is there. And this more or less goes on to your talent and workforce management. So there it is important that you do understand with regards to how do you effectively manage these workforce? How do you manage your talent? Because you need to make some certain decisions, like for example, which products do I start if you're manufacturing? Or which um, effectively employees do I leave at home um, uh, in terms of remote working? Or which one do I bring back in the office? So again, these are all in terms of decisions that you have to make. Supply chain disruption. I think that's fundamental because as we can see um, uh, with COVID, I think it's caused significant um, supply chain disruption. So understanding um, in terms of your supply chain is very critical. Understanding in terms of the end, well, the, the beginning to end, having that visibility, understanding in terms of the control, um, a formulating assessment to understand the various risk and the various assessment around your supply chain so you're better able to respond. The customer and brand, here, um, it is very fundamental, well, it's fundamental again to understand that your customers, obviously, they will have new va new values, new habits, new consumption patterns, you know? So how do you accommodate for that? You know, brand, effectively brand loyalty here is is really interesting because one thing that we do see is that how do you as entrepreneurs or businesses, how do you protect your brand, especially during COVID? Um, and what do you do um, to ensure that effectively you are maintaining that brand loyalty? So again, that's fundamental with regards to resilience. Financial reengineering, again, this is no uh, hidden secret, but at the end of the day, it is fundamental how you look in terms of your profit and loss, your balance sheet. You know? How do you ensure that effectively that you undertake various kind of cost rationalization? Now, of course, you know, when one can always look at in terms of cutting jobs, but, you know, it is very, very difficult for you to cut too deeply because at the end of the day, you do need your talent and your workforce. So, again, these are key assessments that you have to take risk management and BCP. You know, I, I guess you must have heard that over and over again. So, again, this is really important. Understanding government and public policy, understanding the way government is ticking, the what they're doing, how they are making their decision. This is uh, fundamental for you as businesses to ensure that you can react and you are ready to react when interventions or one measures are announced. Digital transformation, 
you have to be ready as an organization. And we have seen with deep structural changes in all the economies that now everyone is pretty much using the e-word, e-commerce, you know, e-this, you know, we're doing webinars here. So again, how do you ensure that you are transforming your skill set, your employee skill set to take um, in terms of to accommodate with regards to the structural change? Sorry, next slide. Um, so very quickly here, um, what, what I've done here is just to, to show you in terms of how from um, the previous slide, how effectively is then translated into various tools and models and policies, um, government policies, um, and that effectively that has helped the private sector um, to ensure that they can manage this risk and uncertainty to enhance their resilience. So um, I, I've tried to more or less put certain pictures um, uh, to, to at least show you in terms of the various tools and models that we have um, worked together with various stakeholders and partners to um, assist MSMEs in Seychelles as we more or less undergo this economic crisis um, and to ensure that we become much more resilient. So here um, we have the work from home guide examples, you know, um, and various kind of other tools. You know, I, unfortunately, I, I won't have a lot of time to go through that. But um, um, this is again shows you the interlink between having sound in terms of understanding of the different um, aspect of resilience to ensure that you have the right tools and more and the government policy. Next slide, please. Um, so um, here again, it's just certain initiatives that we, we, we have launched in Seychelles to support in terms of the, the, the MSMEs. We've got various kind of support on, on, on funds. Um, we've got in terms of trying to build the capacity. We work with ILO to push in terms of programs to MSMEs to ensure that they can sustain in terms of this pandemic. Next slide, please. And here, my, my, my final slide is, is really is to just embody um, with regards to when we do look in terms of what is going on right now, it is important for policymakers to really kind of understand the private sector's agenda, um, to understand what makes um, MSME ticks, what makes um, MSME in terms of tribe, what makes them so well? What makes them strong to adapt? So, what we've done, we've done a, a, a framework um, that we have presented to the government to basically show them in terms of what we call the national business agenda. So, as you can see on the on the left, which is the framework for recovery and prosperity. Unfortunately, I won't have time to go through it, um, but this is very important for policy. And finally, on the right hand side, you will see that it is also very important that there is an active discussion with public health and the government in general to really understand what is going on and how uh, governments does respond to um, uh, to this pandemic how do they respond with regards to any potential lockdowns so at least there's that discussion there's that consultation with the private with the private sector and that really ensures that there's stability for the msmes Sorry, I've had to um, uh, rush through the slides, but I hope that this 10 minutes um, uh, effectively have, have assisted you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Destian, um, for your very valuable presentation. Um, I've also shown the poll results and will again, um, right before the Q&A for everybody to have um, a better feel for the results. And now I would like to welcome to the forum Ms. Hadija Jabiri. She's the founder of GBRI Eat Fresh and based in Tanzania. Ms. Jabiri, I welcome you to the floor. Thank you so much. Um, it's really a great honor to, to get this opportunity to share our resilient story, how we have been able to navigate some of the impacts brought by COVID-19 to our business. And uh, I'm happy that the previous prevent, uh, presenters have, have somehow pictured uh, impacts of COVID to businesses, but also they gave insights of how businesses can, 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 can adapt to the situation. So as I was introduced, my name is Hadija Jabiri and I'm, I'm a co-founder and managing director of, of Jibri Business Solutions. Next. 
So our company is, is, is basically a horticultural company. We, we have been growing vegetables and fruits and marketing these vegetables and fruits in the local market, but also in, in export market. We started this business five years back. When we started uh, the first two years in business, we were growing for the local market. But from 2017, we saw a huge opportunity in export of horticultural produce. And we somehow decided to tap into, into that market. And uh, here in Tanzania, we are based in, in southern part of the country. And for those who are not aware of Tanzania, uh, uh, southern highlands comprises of six regions. And it's a place which is well known for food production. It's like the whole country depends on southern highlands when it comes to food production. The, the, the weather is good here, but also we have water bodies, we have plenty of land, and uh, it's really favorable for horticultural uh, production. That's the reason why we decided to, to position ourselves in this area. Next. Yeah, so just to give you a glimpse of, of our capacity, we have been exporting uh, five to seven metric tons of produce, depending on, on the season. When it's peak, it's peak season, we're going uh, above that. And when it's low season, it could be a bit below uh, the average metric tons I've just mentioned. We have a team of 31 people, though in a weekly basis, you have been getting 60 to 100 casual workers coming to work, but uh, uh, export market requires volumes. So 30% of what we have been exporting was coming from our own farms and 70% was coming from outgrowers. These are smallholder farmers. And when I speak of smallholder farmers in our case, it's someone owning less than one acre. So sometimes you could find it's a group of women, let's say it is 20 women having two acres, growing their vegetables, expecting to sell to our company. And what we were doing uh, was training them on good agricultural practice and, and giving them extension services. So as a company, we hired uh, a team of agronomists and these people were visiting smallholder farmers' farms and giving them technical advice. And uh, uh, we have been exporting nanny traditional crops. When I say nanny traditional crops, I mean crops which are not so known to Tanzanians, the likes of baby corn, snow peas, sugar snap, French beans. Though initially when we started our business, we were growing traditional crops, but when we moved it to export market, we also had to change uh, the type of crops we were growing next. Yeah, so you can see a picture of some of our, our products. Next. Yeah, so uh, coming to COVID-19, for us, 2020 was, was a year of expansion. Those are the plans we, we had initially. We, we just, uh, last year, end of last year, we were approved for, for funding. We got uh, a big grant from the Netherlands government. It was a grant, a mulching grant. We got the investor. We, we also had a project which somehow required us to engage 2,000 smallholder farmers. So we, we were now supposed to move from 400 to 2,000 smallholder farmers. And we had plans to invest on cold storage infrastructures here in Iringa. But unfortunately, it just happened. No one planned for COVID-19. And we, 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 we just had now, we, we have to stop our business. And uh, we closed our doors for six, six months. It's just, if, if all of you can remember, when, when the disease started to spread in Europe, of course, countries were taking strict measures just to make sure it is not uh, spreading. And uh, some of those measures included ban of, of, of international flights. And we depended entirely on air freight to take our produce from Tanzania to Europe, but also there was a uh, pain, cost of logistics went up. We, we were uh, importing some of our inputs and packaging materials from neighboring countries. And at a certain point, we were not able to do that. But also uh, there was uh, avoidance of social gatherings. So we, we had all the reasons to close our doors. And at that time, I remember one of our priority was just to make sure our employees are safe and we had to put the numbers aside for a certain period of time. So uh, we, we negotiated with our employees. Some of them had to stay 
and uh, keep on looking at uh, produce which were on the ground, though we, we they were doing it with precautions. And some of our employees had to stop, had to go home for unpaid leave, though we, we somehow supported them just to make sure they can sustain their families. And uh, our farmers could not keep on with production. Very unfortunate, many of them had produce on the ground and uh, our company have been engaging them to grow nani traditional crops so uh, even if they, they waited for produce to get to maturity but they could not supply locally and uh, if, if the literal that they produced could go to the local market directly it was supposed to be the hotels which were also closed on early days of, of COVID-19 so generally that is how COVID-19 affected us and uh, we could not just sit and, and look at the impacts of it. Somehow we had to think, what are we doing next? Next. Yeah, so uh, after all that I've explained, all the, the, the uh, effects of COVID to our company, we decided to somehow rethink of our marketing strategy. We were entirely depending on, on export market. Whatever that we were growing was going to the export market. But uh, I had to ask myself, like we have uh, the local market, how can we come back to the local market? Very unfortunate, it was a point where uh, we had very little resources. Our cash flow was, was no longer like the way it used to be before. So we just had to look at what we had at that time. Like we have the Parkhouse facility. We do have people, our employees, but we have uh, uh, trucks. How can we use this to come back to the local market? So we decided to add some new products on our portfolio. We added uh, avocados, we added bananas, we added beans uh, and uh, we also added potatoes. And what we are now doing is going to Rungwe, which is in Bear, Bear region. It's like 300 kilometers from where we are. We are buying uh, green bananas and, and the other fruits which, which I've mentioned, mangoes and, and avocados. And then we are taking this to our uh, facilities in Iringa. We are ripening these fruits and distributing to vegetable and fruits vendors. And so far we have been able to reach like 200 vegetable vendors and the question we have been asking ourselves the business is going well as much as it, it also came with its own challenges but for us at least we now have cash flow at least we have been able to bring back most of our employees and at least th there are activities going on at our park house every day but also uh, just because of COVID-19 we had an investor, we were actually on the final negotiations and he, he was not certain anymore whether he's still interested to invest in our business. Of course, it is well understandable because this person invested in other businesses in Africa and most of, of businesses were, were largely impacted by, by COVID-19. So for us, we could not sit and wait until when he makes a decision, we, we had to go out there and start looking for new investors, but also have been writing many proposals trying to find support from development partners. I'm really grateful. Some of the partners we had even before COVID-19 have been working with us. They have not left us alone. They have been very flexible, of course, with the project which were on the ground. Some of them have given us extension and we are really great but also we had to go to the bank before COVID-19 we had no loan uh, I was using other ways to mobilize resources but now I had to go to the bank and, and ask for support and I'm grateful uh, Tanzania Agricultural Development Bank is, is now uh, finding ways to support what we are doing in the local market and the last thing which we did I, I had to think of business diversification like Jibri was was a promising business People are now becoming more health conscious. People are buying more vegetables and fruits and everything was looking so bright. But COVID-19 happened and we're not sure when the situation will get back to normal. But at the same time, uh, for me, it was like, is there any other opportunity I can take advantage of? So I decided to register a new company. I currently have a startup which is entirely based on agri-tech, but we do consultation services and capacity building. And we have been using the same resources we had on the ground, like 
uh, our our extension officers are the same who are now going to to train people to to build capacity to farmers and by doing that we are getting more revenues through that uh, new company and we are hoping maybe to get to a point where this this new company is supporting the existing company. So those are just some of the things which we did to try to mitigate impacts which were brought by COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Jabiri, for your wonderful presentation. And without further ado, we will migrate to uh, Ms. Basma Ali, the founder of G Gateway in West Bank. Many thanks and I welcome you to the floor. Thank you very much. Um, I'm very happy to, to be here today. Um, as a choose, uh, we uh, I am the CEO and the co-founder of uh, a social or impact business in Palestine. Uh, we have uh, been established uh, since 2015. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Yes, so G Gateway is an impact, a Palestinian in business, founded in 2015 uh, by a group of experienced entrepreneurs, uh, mainly women, I am one of them, uh, and uh, it was uh, founded to create positive impact uh, by building a sustainable business that generates employment in outsourcing uh, industry. And so we are aiming to build the first outsourcing factory or outsourcing regional hub in Palestine. We are uh, joint, we, we have identified the, the outsourcing industry as a skyrocketing industry with a, a, a size of $200 billion. And they, they, they mainly depend on uh, manpower in ICT. Uh, we have been uh, granted uh, to be expanded uh, to be a regional outsourcing hub by World Bank. Also, we have been uh, fe we were featured in back in 2018 as a next generation leader according to Times uh, Next Generation Program uh, Next Generation Leaders uh, Program Assessment. Also, I am the winner of, of SDG and Hair Competition on behalf of MENA region in 2020 for my work with G Gateway. Can we go to the next? So G Gateway impact figures, uh, what, uh, who we are working with. We work with two main uh, revenue stream. One comes from clients and other comes for donors in order to build the capacity of youth. Our clients uh, can be from all over the world. Uh, they are from UN, they are multinational companies, and uh, now we are expanding more uh, in, the, uh, in the market to include uh, more segments. Our supporters or donors uh, varies, and uh, they, they we have around seven uh, donors. Uh, our business value profile so far is one million USD. Um, this is also we have a solid investment from World Bank to be expandable model. Can we next? So our services, what our youth are capable or what our business operation is offering. Uh, as you can see, we offer software engineering and uh, project management, design verification, content management, data management. Also, we have our uh, talent development department. So we provide or match uh, making some of our uh, capital here in Palestine with companies overseas as a remote employees. Uh, so far, we have trained over 1,000 graduates. We have outreach over 4,000. We have created, uh, in total, long-term and short-term jobs around 1,100 uh, job, uh, uh, 1,100 job in the past four years. Can we go to next? So I, I would like to to tap on our talking points and really thank all the previous uh, speakers and and panelists. If they if they really put the big picture for the business uh, struggles, especially the medium and the small businesses. Uh, for uh, for us in G Gateway, we have um, 
we have done a lot. We, we, we in Palestine have a little bit of uh, instability in the political situation and uh, in running um, on emergency mode. And COVID-19 landed over too many other uh, emergencies or urgencies we have in the region. Um, so one, my main talking points will be through what I thought was I should have done uh, when uh, we were building the enterprise or the lessons learned, my lessons learned in during the past five years in building a medium or a small enterprise in very challenging, unstable uh, situation and being resilient. So uh, first, first thing or first point is accepting uncertainties and risks. Um, uh, accept that they are high at the start when you start your new business or when you start a new activity and it's okay and don't spend too much time on idealizing uh, your documents and the plans because and don't worry too much about it about your perfect business model don't worry about putting everything in a plan and in a fixed form because you are still testing your ideas and uh, it it can be you you can end up by you know having it all in, you know that your first design having it all wrong so or or not too truthful so save your energy to for more uh, productive uh, actions so um, the most important thing that uh, I found it um, very challenging is the business model um, many I landed sometimes you start your business model and with you have your hottest product and and you think you you're gonna win but basically if you don't have your cost structure right if you are not making money uh, the business will not be successful uh, and this is something I I was uh, I was experiencing in in my business because I inherited certain costing or certain cost structure or pricing and I didn't modify it I didn't tested my I didn't redesign or, or or did in the first place the roadmap for my you know revenues that comes from the business and then from the others and, and my operation so it was really very hard to alter but the change is painful but if you don't change if you don't think agile if you don't respond to the changes that's happened around you. Your business will not um, will not make it through the, the the change or through the challenging times. So I was searching about the different models of impact businesses and how we can alter it, and the proposing new ones for the investor, like new better ones. Uh, and we also design, test it, measure it, and alter accordingly. Um, we try to decrease the uh, uncertainty. Sorry, there is a, a, type, a, type, a typo error. Uh, we, we decrease uncertainty by testing. So by having our services uh, testing and doing multiple, multiple, small, multiple small pilots and test cases. We also, many of our IT entrepreneur, uh, they don't build enough to test and measure. We only do a prototype. And this is uh, really was um, a holding back because we have expectation, uh, unrealistic expectation. So I would recommend that you build until you are able to test and measure. It's uh, much more better than you know having a prototype and 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 start to market for it. Um, third and and uh, or one of the main points was our cost, our running cost or operation cost, and monitoring cash flow during crisis, either it's a conflict or COVID-19, uh, because for us it's the same. We, in, in both cases, we stay home and on-site operation uh, suspend. Uh, so what we do, we enable our employees to work from home. We plan for that, and we have a business uh, continuity plan. Um, uh, but in the same time also, and this is was very useful in keeping our cash flowing. So if you have the right action or the right frame intervention, uh, the right framework for the intervention during the crisis, uh, your cash flow will be, will be uh, much better. Um, as I said, we have to think agile. So we have to uh, 
to be consciously willing and able to alter our thinking based on the raised in new needs or requirements, either by crisis or by, you know, by conflict or COVID-19 or, or certain changes in the market sometimes makes us, uh, you know, uh, changing our uh, thinking and our, we, our design thinking will be very different. Business uh, starts only after um, you, you're, uh, after we find the right business model and the value proposition. Uh, many of uh, the expectation when we started was like, oh, you are running business and your business model is good, cetera, but in fact, it wasn't. We were testing. Uh, and uh, so you have to make it clear that you have an idea and you are testing it and you are developing it. So your business is not rewarding until your business model is complete and tested and working. Can we go to the next slide? So the tools and, and models for entrepreneurs to manage risk and uncertainty. During uh, our work, we have experienced two types of risks. Risks we don't choose, they are there around us. We live in Palestine, West Bank and Gaza. Political situation is not great. There is access limitation on resources. There is um, also limitation on the movement. So those are risks that we have to deal with. And this is where you have to do your assessment, identify it and do your risk management plan and try to mitigate the critical risks for your business. Um, there are risks we choose to, to have in order to learn and grow. And this is, it's very important to distinguish between both. Uh, so we, we are not totally hiding when we are building the business. You have to take a studied risk. Um, and this is uh, the natural of the growth. We can't grow without taking a studied risk. Um, for what happened recently within COVID-19 uh, situation in, in Palestine, uh, we have uh, developed a business continuity plan or framework um, that has impact analysis. So we uh, try to understand the impact of lockdown and the new health measurements and, and the new working space uh, aspects, how COVID-19 affected them. And we draw a recovery strategy, like what needed to be done in highlights. And we plan development. So we plan actions uh, and um, activities and also seek the uh, donors, government, and uh, clients uh, support in understanding the situation and we are in transition. Uh, thanks to God, we are an IT company, so IT can travel, you know, beyond borders. Uh, and as I said, we have run to crisis before and our Louise, our, uh, infrastructure at home allows them to work from home. Uh, all the COVID-19 has uh, raised unexpected situations because also school system is down and there is a pressure on the families regarding the health and the hygiene. So we have assessed all these aspects and try to build intervention for our teams as, uh, as much as we can. We sustained, we have run to two months where we lost, uh, where two projects were completely suspended because they were training programs and uh, we weren't allowed to do training. So what we have done is we uh, transferred our content to be virtually. So part of it was self-learning on the online platforms for our associates. And the other was uh, through uh, Zoom sessions and uh, you know, uh, interactive uh, online uh, sessions. Um, we have tested and exercised um, all the, you know, the actions in, in the, the plans that we have developed, some of them worked, some of them didn't work. What worked uh, was uh, empowering people to work from home. It maintained really a minimum productivity for the client where we were, where we uh, managed to sustain uh, our clients and you know gain more contacts. Although the donors projects or the impact projects was a little bit, uh, um, the impact of COVID-19 was very harsh on them and 
and we tried to do self-learning and we tried to do online sessions. The struggle was that the trainees, um, you know, home infrastructure is not, wasn't allowing them to be engaged online. So uh, it didn't work and we have to, to redesign our programs again to allocate some assistance for trainees in order to have access online. Uh, last, can we go to the next, uh, to the last slide? Yes, uh, regarding the policies that the uh, government uh, can implement to promote resilience, uh, having an, a participatory approach in implementing any projects, development projects for the medium and small businesses. And I have seen multiple models, especially in New Zealand, that was very successful. Also coordinating efforts between the government and the private sector a uh, social procurement framework uh, it could, in, it could ensure inclusive uh, growth um, and also encourage, uh, encourage others to um, encourage medium and small businesses to apply uh, for uh, government bids. Um, institutional and regulatory framework, I think my, colleague, my peers has uh, covered that, facilitating market and resource access, uh, including the financial assistance in, uh, during COVID-19, better knowledge transfer and network to different industry. Thank you and sorry for my fast speech. I think we are running out of time. <clears throat> Thank you so very much, uh, Ms. Ali. It was a really great presentation and it's really amazing to hear from two entrepreneurs um, themselves. So um, next up, we would like to welcome our last panelist for the day, um, Mr. Avinesh Nanda Kumar. He's the co-founder of Hyphen, based in Belgium. And um, without further ado, I welcome you to the floor. Thank you, Julia. Um, and obviously, thank you, Antad and Unitar, for organizing this, and also all the previous speakers. Uh, great to hear your stories and and also the, your insights, and hope to add some relevant um, content uh, to the discussion. Um, can we go to the next slide, please? Perfect. So um, maybe just a few words about myself, and then um, adding a few lines on 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 what we do as Hyphen. So my name is Avinash Nandakumar. Um, I'm a co-founder and also managing director of uh, Hyphen. Um, what we basically are in the business of is we are in the business of providing um, clients and institutions such as governments, um, professional services firms and investment managers with um, sort of project based talent. Um, what does this specifically mean? Um, usually these institutions approach us uh, with a very specific problem that they're trying to solve or um, a specific solution that they're trying to build up um, and they're looking for sort of talent globally um, to help them sort of address these challenges. And we basically support them in finding this kind of relevant talent um, for them to then engage with um, and effectively produce sort of solutions for their, these specific business problems that they may have. Um, and just for everyone to get sort of a sense, right? Um, this to some extent is, is something that is is very much an, an emerging field um, as something that is spawning out of, of, of this gig economy kind of a setup, um, just that I guess the, the, the labor market or labor segment that is in scope of this is really highly trained, experienced professionals. Um, and we'll talk about how and why we think this is a growing segment and particularly also how MSMEs globally can make use of, of sort of this growing talent pool um, who could be highly relevant for them in sort of building sort of uh, and leveraging them for particular specific business problems they may have or also in this specific case of actually making their businesses more resilient right um if we can go to the next slide please perfect um so talking about this sort of expert global expert network and and, and the global talent pool um that we specifically are sort of using and, and, and leveraging for some of the clients that we, we try to serve. Um, I think there is something that has evolved dramatically, as mentioned before, over the past five years in the sense that we see more and more experienced professionals sort of shifting out of classical employment models where they're in fixed jobs into shifting into a working model where they like to work in a project setup, where they're independent, um, choose whom they are working with, on what projects they're working with, and then also what setups they're working with. Um, 
and to some extent become their own independent uh, sort of person in, in the labor market. Um, this is insofar quite interesting in the sense that um, it can be tremendously sort of the, the engagements they participate in vary tremendously, um, both from sort of a location perspective, but also from an economic perspective. We've seen all kinds of experts who engage with global companies and, and global governments on, 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 on sort of specific projects, but also um, see a lot of these experts um, who, have, who are distinguished leaders in certain fields um, engage with projects which they historically would have never worked on um, in classical employment models, but because it's of interest for them, um, they sort of deep dive deep into it um, and support sort of smaller companies, um, mid-sized companies, or, or also NGOs on topics that they're, they, they sort of feel like interests them and gives them a cause. So this is something that has drastically changed over the past few years. And Primarily, it's driven by a few factors. On the one hand, obviously, um, the financial independence that comes through some of these practitioners having already worked for 30 years in a specific field. But one particular um, topic that I guess we're observing even today, um, and, and we'll talk about it specifically also when we when we go into the discussion around COVID, right, is location independence, right? So I think it's gotten pretty much the norm, and now particularly with COVID, that um, people are able to work from wherever they want um, and on whatever topic they want with whomever globally. Um, and this is basically opening up this entire talent pool um, to work and operate in different time zones, in different economic models, um, and in different setups that five or 10 years ago was relatively unheard of, right? And now if we specifically talk about this, this, this sort of experienced talent pool um, and our observations that we were able to make as part of COVID is that it literally has radically amplified this available pool of experts globally. On the one hand, and also the demand for it um, in parallel, on the one hand, we've seen um, governments, but also companies um, more and more looking for people in these sort of very specific areas where they just need someone to address a specific problem in a short period of time. So this project gig focused work is becoming more and more predominant also in how these corporations and, and governments are employing people. Um, and in the second instance, when we talk about the supply side, there's a surge of, of, of experts, both voluntarily, mostly voluntarily, and sometimes also involuntarily, um, through early retirements, through redundancies, through also just the flexibility that arises um, through people not being able to travel, um, opening up sort of no, new independent work models, right? And I think the last point that is really worth mentioning, which which I think is, is very much also sort of uh, reflective of the time we're living in, is that this is really a product of us being able to leverage sort of remote working, working from home, which particularly now with COVID is pretty much the norm across all locations. Um, and at the same time, also having this proof that this is really a setup that works, that people are able to use these collaboration tools as we are working now with, for example, Zoom or with Slack or anything else um, that effectively sort of shows that it is possible to work across time zones in a productive setting um, that basically has sort of further more emphasized that these kind of models work, right? So maybe now jumping over in how this becomes relevant for MSMEs, um, if we go to the next slide, I think we particularly see that um, MSMEs can make use of, 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 of this sort of changing landscape of, of expertise and talent and, and using these networks in two distinct ways. On the one hand, um, they can tap into this global talent pool, right? I mean, we're talking about sort of an, an infinite number um, of, 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 of experts across any kind of topic that an MSME may be facing where there's certainly people out there who have the answers who can quickly help on very specific niche questions and topics and building solutions, oftentimes also in a very economically feasible way, in the sense that oftentimes it it's it's a passion project for people and 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 particularly for people who have spent their entire careers on 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 developing a certain skill set, um, they come to a point where for them it's more 
um, important to sort of pass on that knowledge and and share that experience with 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 founders with with small and medium enterprises um, and also in setups which which sort of are economically viable for MSMEs globally. Um, now, obviously, I think the bigger challenge is how does one access as an MSME this kind of this kind of talent, right? On the one hand, I think there 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 is a great existing network, um, and and I, I think went with. Mr. Bastian, a great speaker from, from the Chamber of Commerce in the Seychelles, I think these kind of institutions and networks are tremendously valuable for establishing these kind of sort of um, connections between individuals and experts. But on the other hand, and this is something that we feel is underestimated oftentimes by individuals and, and companies themselves, just if you think about an MSME, the amount of um, employees they have, the amount of partners they have, customers, suppliers, all these um, points, they act, practically act as a node for getting introductions to second degree or third degree um, sort of uh, institutions, which at the same time can be tremendously helpful, right? Um, and obviously then we have the entire uh, sort of topic around um, LinkedIn and, and social media, which can be useful um, in getting in touch with these kind of institutions as well. And if we sort of dive on to how MSMEs can also sort of become a valuable resource in this market, I think there is the whole concept of what MSMEs across or globally can be or underestimate sometimes is that they themselves hold a lot of knowledge, which can be of tremendous value for individuals and co corporations, um, which then again can lead to interesting partnerships and and sort of short term and long term potentials and opportunities that are out there. Right. Maybe moving to to the last slide um, and and concluding this uh, whole discussion. Julia, there should be last slide. Ah, perfect. Thank you. Um, so what needs to happen to effectively sort of make use of that? Um, on the one hand, I think MSMEs can sort of adjust their or they need to adjust their employment models and also how they think about talent um, to also sort of incorporate for this flexible employment models. And I think one point which very much resonated also with what Ms. Ali had said is they need to get used to this topic of failing fast and, and, and failing forward, right? So quickly trying things out, figuring out what works and what doesn't work, and then sort of going and onward with the things that effectively have proven to have a, success, a successful track record. And at the same time, also thinking into adjacent fields and, and sort of not just being focused on their individual um, specific niche. On the other hand, I think there's also a huge potential in how governments can support um, these, these sort of um, as MSMEs in, in, in supporting this model, right? By sort of supporting these employment models, um, obviously knowing that, you know, reducing bureaucracy is key, um, providing incentives, and at the same time, um, actually becoming customers uh, of products that are developed through these kind of ways um, and, and, and creative models as well. I think that can be tremendously helpful for MSMEs to tap into this pool and, and make use of this global talent pool, which, which could hopefully increase building more sound, business models and, 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 and increasing resilience. Yeah. Thank you very much. That's it from my side. Thank you so very much, Mr. Nanda Kumar. Um, really, truly, we had exceptional presentations from all of our panelists. Um, we would like to thank you so much for your presence and um, your speeches. And now I would like to give over the floor back to uh, Mr. Alex Mejia, the director of UNITAR for the Division for People and Social Inclusion. Um, and he will help me in tandem and um, the rest of the panelists to go through and um, moderate the Q&A session. Thank you so very much, dear Alex, the floor is yours. Thank you, Julian, and thank you all, um, dear panelists, uh, for helping us very much achieve um, what were the objectives um, of this discussion. And uh, before I uh, moderate this uh, short um, question and answer, I would like to actually read what the invitation said, so you'll see why I just mentioned that. The discussion objectives for this um, webinar were as follows, um, to identify and analyze the main impacts of COVID-19 on entrepreneurs and micro, small and medium-sized enterprises, their reactions, 
as well as the support they have received to face the current situation. These examples and your practical experiences and the model presented by Professor Ello have definitely achieved um, that. Uh, the documents say, uh, because we have to deliver what we promise um, to all our participants, so bear with me. The document says, under discussion objectives, discussions will provide an opportunity for an intermediate impact assessment of the disruption using some examples and will help to identify a set of priority policies and measures for immediate vaccine, basic reopening measures for small business orders in order to facilitate resurgence and to build resilience and to also develop a longer term social and economic recovery strategy where entrepreneurs and MSMEs play a central role leaving no one behind. So thank you for listening. It's, it's a little long, uh, but it's important to remember why is it that we came here in the first place? And um, uh, I think uh, after the introduction from UNTAD and uh, perhaps some remarks uh, from ourselves at UNITAR, um, the, 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 the practical experiences that we have received indeed uh, have um, allowed us to understand what could be done, uh, using your examples, what can be done to actually go back to normal, to diversify, to better understand risk, to test, as uh, Ms. Ali say, uh, and so on and so forth. So I have several questions here, and I'm going to read the first, and I'm going to uh, invite any of you uh, speakers um, and panelists uh, to take the floor. First one says, this is received from participants, of course. For the sake of inclusiveness, what can be done to take into account startups into already existing companies, to join them, to work closely with them, especially companies that thrive during this pandemic. So uh, the typical example that I'm sure you remember is um, that um, uh, these uh, winning sectors and winning corporations, some SMEs uh, do the math, do the work, and actually try to find an opportunity to become a provider, uh, a supplier uh, to that big corporation. So um, you, 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 you jump on the winning wagon, for, for lack of a better analogy. So who can give us um, some comments um, on, on that? How uh, can um, uh, an SME perhaps go about doing this? The floor is open. And as I, I used to, to do uh, uh, before in, in, in one uh, seminar that we have with UNITAR, where the question perhaps was a little too general. Let me invite Professor uh, Elo. Uh, uh, she did a magnificent job indeed uh, in um, giving us an academic framework and beyond that uh, in trying to understand uh, what is it that, that, that companies could do with all the uh, academic background in, in some of those uh, uh, postulates that she presented us. So Professor, if I may ask you, um, what do you think can be done in this particular scenario? How can a, an a MSME uh, join um, on, on a winning wagon, um, uh, uh, be part of uh, the supply network, perhaps of a winning corporation? Floor, floor to you. Thank you very much. So I think this is a very, very good question. And uh, we, we certainly have a lot of challenges in, in, in fulfilling this, this uh, question. First of all, I think those companies who want to kind of get into the to the beneficial network they have to have already some network ties so they need to do you know that you cannot sit in your own garage and become a, an apple today you have to do your networking you have to have your contacts you have to be somehow participating already in a in a local ecosystem in a global ecosystem like we had a fantastic example of the global talent perhaps you're part of some kind of global talent and you have a you have a brand name in terms of your your knowledge in terms of your value creation. And I would also like to, to, to turn the question around and say, when we have highly successful companies, those companies also need customers and partners in the future. So they cannot go completely alone. They need to have others with them. So, so perhaps we need to also kind of look at the things, not from a kind of pure success failure link, but kind of, how many do I take with me so that I can also grow in the future? So it's also a question for the big ones, the successful ones, and not just for the, the kind of startuppers. 
I mean, we, we are all together in this one. Well said, well said indeed. Uh, it's part of the social responsibility that we all carry, big and small and so on. Uh, excellent, Professor Ello, thank you so much. Now a question uh, for Miss Ali. I was really impressed, uh, Miss Ali, with um, uh, G Gateway. And I did uh, uh, go before to your uh, webpage. Congratulations. Uh, you practice what you, you, you sell. And um, the portfolio that you have on IT outsourcing services and data management and so on, in uh, web content development, uh, software development, app development even, but more important, the uh, capacity building side of what you do. Uh, and the fact that you are based in Palestine, uh, of course, uh, will always catch uh, our attention. And on top of it, that you are focused on women. Uh, uh, we are uh, here really do our best uh, as, uh, as part of the United Nations system, as you know, to um, uh, empower uh, uh, the other gender and, and hopefully to achieve gender uh, balance. In your region, uh, efforts of um, uh, entities like yours are very much appreciated. So I have a question for you also received from uh, a participant. It says, what actors in the public sector are responsible for entrepreneurship resilience? So is it only the government, the multilateral organizations, uh, the UN? Can you give us some comments? Because I do know that you work with uh, several public entities. Ms. Ali, please. I think you are muted. Hello? Can you, can you hear us? Uh, Miss Ali, I see you, uh, but I cannot hear you. Can you hear us? I, I think we, we will wait uh, until she can uh, join us. And then I'll go to the next uh, question uh, related to the agribusiness uh, sector. And the case of Tanzania, uh, indeed, um, uh, was uh, quite impressive. Um, and uh, you have shown us what resilience is, is, is actually about. Um, uh, something happened here, take the alternate road, uh, route, right? Uh, don't just sit on your hands and wait until something happens. And uh, this um, example of uh, they're still using your infrastructure now with different agricultural products and um, different markets, uh, if I understand, going 300 kilometers away uh, to include some things and so on. Um, it's, it's important um, uh, to see as an example that will motivate uh, us. But then uh, here uh, we have a question that says, um, um, in order to support SMEs in Tanzania, what has the government uh, done during this pandemic? Can we perhaps uh, understand better the role of the government, how you see that? Um, have you received uh, uh, some uh, support from them, guidance from them, or are you expecting to receive it? Uh, the floor to you. Thank you so much for, for the question. Uh, go ahead, please. In Tanzania, we, we had no lockdown and uh, we had restrictions when cases were announced, but at a certain point, uh, the government stopped giving notifications of, of, of uh, COVID-19 cases and businesses are going on as usual. But if I can remember earlier, uh, somehow the Ministry of Trade instructed banks to reduce interest rate, which I'm not so sure if it was done or it was not, but also there was instruction to give a kind of uh, payment holiday to businesses which you already had uh, loans uh, from commercial banks. But uh, I remember when uh, there was uh, restrictions, borders were closed and freight could not move from one country to another. The government uh, together with Tanzania Horticultural Association somehow negotiated with Ethiopian Air and they started bringing the, the, the cargo flight to take horticultural produce to Europe. But unfortunately, it was too expensive. Cost of, of, of freight almost doubled and that posed a new challenge to business people because you cannot just export. You have to look at the numbers by doing that. Are you making profit or you're making losses? And it was a time when even the market in, in, in Europe was not so certain, 
most of customers were not buying anymore. They were uh, in lockdowns. So, so far that is what I remember. But now, unlike what is happening in other countries, we do not get notifications and we, we have no idea whether we still have COVID-19 or we do not have COVID-19. And life, life is, is back as, 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 as usual, yeah. Thank you, thank you indeed. Uh, uh, very specific and very relevant. I, I appreciate that. Let me now go uh, to the case of the Seychelles. Uh, very good presentation. Uh, uh, my admiration for that, in particular for the, uh, the, the SCCI model. Um, and you saw that we had a question um, uh, on the poll that appears uh, for the participants uh, as a pop-up. Uh, and uh, you saw the results. But I wanted to ask you, uh, if you can put it, uh, uh, Julie, I'm sorry that I didn't give you a heads up, but just find that slide and put it on. I, I think it's important to remember it. There are very many models, but the, this one, uh, no, not the one of the poll, uh, uh, because of course the vast majority of the people agree and I strongly agree, almost 90%, but the actual slide from the presentation, um, employee health and well-being, talent and workforce management, supply chain disruption, customer and brand, attention to fiscal re-engineering, risk management and business continuity plans, government and public policy assistance, and then digital transformation. So can I um, uh, offer you the floor to um, uh, give us, uh, to answer this question, uh, uh, based, based on, your, on your model. The question say, is there a holistic approach to build resilience? So next time we have a crisis, we are in a better place. I think your uh, model is holistic. Can you give us uh, some comments on that, uh, Mr. Olivier? Uh, um, thank you very much. Um, I, I, when we when we looked in terms of trying to build this model um, uh, to assist in terms of SMEs um, and to 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 really ensure that you know, we 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 are looking at for them to survive, to adapt, and then to grow. These were the three slogans that we we use so surviving adapting and then growing so effectively we we started um, really looking at the the problems um uh, of msmes and business in general but um uh, of course when we started diving into the the various perspective and the operations of the business this is what really kind of came out quite strongly for us and we wanted to ensure that whatever policies that we advocate whatever tools that we, we, we propose or we formulate for the MSMEs, pretty much covered in terms of the areas that impacts them the most. And, you know, I mean, when I listen to all the, the actual um, panelists intervene, it, it's more or less all the stuff that we've talked about fits into these one, one point to the, to, the eight, well, to the eight points. So in a way, it's um, it, it more or less embodies in terms of all the perspective of the impact that the MSMEs is, is encountering um, and effectively um, uh, to basically start building a model that they can then utilize um, to make them stronger so they can effectively survive, adapt and grow. So we do believe that this um, SCCI model is holistic, but of course we, we, we've learned a lot today and we can refine, as I mentioned in the beginning, our model to ensure that now with the experience of the panelists, I can absorb this and incorporate to assist the MSMEs in, in Seychelles to be much more resilient. So thank you. To you, uh, and a beautiful example and, uh, from beautiful Seychelles, by the way. Um, uh, uh, I do know that your tourism and vibrant tourism industry, uh, and you do represent several sectors, not only that, uh, yeah. is also um, uh, comprised very many uh, MSMEs. Uh, so this holistic approach, as you have commented, very much needed, not a single-minded, single-path approach. Let me now go uh, with the last question because unfortunately we're running out of time. Actually, we ran out of time, but I believe it's important to also offer um, uh, the floor to our, uh, our last speaker, Mr. Avinash Nanda Kumar. And uh, Julia, if you can uh, put his uh, excellent presentation, the next to last, I think, um, slide um, uh, after he talks about the uh, hyphen and he uh, asked some uh, relevant questions about um, uh, the pool of uh, experts that um, can be tackled. Uh, there is a slide entitled as a result, MSME need to become more adaptive and governments can support this shift. This is at uh, the core uh, um, of what we are doing here. Uh, keep going, keep going, keep going. 
and, and take a right there, right there. So you have uh, uh, given us the, uh, this uh, beautiful view of what uh, MSMEs uh, uh, do, but also what governments can do uh, on the left side, um, uh, create new employment models, perhaps more flexible, fail fast, uh, fail forward, um, uh, always with this uh, proactive uh, mentality, and then create and leverage networks. I wanted to focus on that. Uh, thinking, uh, you say, thinking adjacent fields, not just their, your own business model or industry, and then, then you say what uh, governments can do. Can you give us, uh, and then you postulated some uh, uh, good questions at the end of your presentation. Can you tell us how can you go about as an MSME to tackle that expertise um, from someone senior that perhaps can give you a hand? Is the government a facilitator and international organizations a facilitator? How do you actually secure that? Please take the floor. Mm -hmm. No, I think that, uh, thank you, Mr. Maya, for, for the question. I think this is a very valid one, right? Um, what we have seen is, I think there can be various different institutions being a facilitator, whether this is a government itself, whether this is an IO, um, or even sort of more um, industry associations or, or private sector organizations being sort of a conduit. I think the, the amount of facilitators that can be there is infinite, right? I think the essential piece behind it, though, is 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 that one needs to be proactive in one, in in one's own sense, right? So it it starts with actually acknowledging the fact, okay, um, this is a this is something where um, it may make sense for me to speak with someone um, who be who may be more knowledgeable um, and who can help me. I think that is the crucial step. Once that is done, um, as I had mentioned in the presentation, right, it can manifest itself in, in various ways, right? Whatever is available to one in, in one's particular circumstance. And sometimes this can be governments, right? Particularly when it comes to topics such as, you know, when policies become extremely relevant for pushing or innovating um, certain aspects of one, one's business model, right? This is particularly relevant when it comes to certain fields in technology um, or trade. I think there. There are really there is a lot of value of, of, of tapping into networks in, in government and IOs. And in others, it can be more really industry associations and sometimes just even going out and thinking about who may have a solution or, or an answer to questions that one wants, wants to pose, right? And this, this can be all kind of different institutions who most of the time, even just approaching individuals by themselves, one would be quite surprised how reactive people are, right? And, and I think that has for us at least been eye-opening that if one comes up with interesting challenges or interesting problems, even approach individuals, right? Whether that is of, of business nature or, or political economic nature, they're very happy to help, right? Uh, thank you indeed, uh, uh, very, very much so. And um, we receive while you were speaking, one last question on, on uh, uh, not only how to tackle those resources, uh, as you uh, correctly uh, uh, have given us some comments and guidance and, and inputs, but also how to get help to understand how to lower expenses to us to be able to survive longer. Yes, some people from outside, uh, your own Rian can help you perhaps with a fresh mind to come and say, okay, this is your business model. This is your cost structure. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can do this and you can do that. So thank you very, very much. Before uh, we go back to, uh, our colleague, uh, uh, Tatiana Duntat, uh, so she can give us some uh, closing remarks. Uh, and let me just um, uh, make sure that uh, Ms. Ali perhaps uh, is, is, is connected now. Uh, dear Basma, ca can you hear us? Uh, I would like to offer you the floor, um, but we couldn't hear you before. Can you hear us now? Uh, I think she has some uh, connection problems, but uh, still uh, our admiration to all of you and particularly uh, to you in Palestine for what you do to empower women with this excellent uh, uh, portfolio that you have in, in G Gateway and uh, with the capacity building activities that you do. Very good. Uh, time is always short in these webinars, a very valuable conversation with very many fresh ideas and um, uh, perhaps example of resources that we can uh, use. And particularly on behalf of UNITAR, just to conclude from my side, uh, go to our website, it's free. There are very many things that you can use uh, to build capacity while you try to adapt to this new normal. And the same goes for, uh, in the case of UNTAD. UNTAD is the extra, UNITAD is not, but we do offer training um, in this realm, thanks to our partnership with uh, UNTAD. Uh, with that, 
I would like to offer uh, uh, Ms. Grilova the, the last uh, word so she can uh, conclude this webinar. Tatiana, please. Uh, thank you, thank you, Alex, uh, for uh, again for your for giving me the floor. And uh, once again, thank you for this great cooperation that we have. I think that really demonstrates uh, that uh, you know synergies and cooperation can uh, multiply uh, effects of uh, what could be done, especially in this very difficult time where this is really critical, important uh, to reach out, uh, to scale up activities, uh, to provide some online tools which are free. And of course, uh, it's very important. Uh, that's why it's very important that we have an event like this and uh, all uh, such webinars are very important because they really raise awareness of what's available uh, for entrepreneurs, for SMEs, uh, for uh, associations of uh, entrepreneurs, but also for governments who are responsible for entrepreneurship promotion. So that really could be used free of charge uh, very easily. Uh, uh, but of course, the issue of uh, uh, networking, raising awareness and uh, availability of uh, uh, you know, information, again, what, what is available. So I also would like to thank uh, the uh, uh, panelists, uh, you know, really excellent, uh, excellent uh, um, uh, presentations. And uh, one of the objectives of this, uh, this webinar and the series of webinars is really to share practices, share experiences, because we are uh, all, uh, you know, in the same situation and uh, it's new to all of us. And uh, so then really sharing some uh, success stories, uh, uh, regardless of how difficult it is, uh, it's really great. Uh, you know, we here, you know, we have uh, another activity that is a uh, live uh, Empratech webinars where we bring uh, uh, also to attention of uh, entrepreneurs at the national level, uh, uh, jointly with our Empratech centers, success stories also of uh, uh, entrepreneurs in the COVID-19 times. And very often we hear one phrase, if I could do it, anybody could do it. So then, uh, of course, maybe it's not exactly the case because uh, some are more uh, prepared uh, to take re uh, to uh, to address the challenge. Uh, uh, some less prepared, but I think here uh, and again, uh, this is a partnership with the Unitar is very important for Yungtad. Same with uh, other counterparts. They can really um, bring to use uh, different tools that really facilitate resilience, uh, that facilitate uh, preparedness and. Uh, 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 again, awareness uh, of uh, entrepreneurs and small companies, uh, how really to, ta to tackle the challenge. Because we cannot really, of course, address uh, all these questions that are asking, what should I do in this situation? Uh, but then, uh, because all situations are different. Uh, but what is common uh, is this uh, skills and mindset uh, of entrepreneurs uh, to, uh, to, 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 uh, uh, to identify opportunities and to uh, uh, understand also how to tackle these opportunities, including based on these uh, success stories, but also stories of challenges that we share here so that collectively we can find a solution and, uh, and move forward. So uh, again, thank you for all the panelists uh, for great presentations. Thank you also for participants for very engaging uh, uh, questions. Again, here, I think we also can look at the Yungtad website where we have a number of uh, activities and programs, uh, including on uh, uh, supply, uh, uh, supply and uh, um, chain, uh, um, value chain management, including on uh, uh, empowering uh, 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 entrepreneurs and uh, you know, other people uh, by, uh, uh, with, uh, with um, uh, with our Empratec uh, uh, methodology based on behaviors and attitudes and, uh, uh, you know, these uh, skills and competences, which is a bit different to our hard skills and uh, technical knowledge. So, but it's also as much important uh, uh, for entrepreneurs to achieve success as, uh, uh, you know, learning uh, different uh, hard skills and, uh, um, um, and um, uh, awareness of what could be done uh, from that standpoint. So I also would like to thank both teams uh, of uh, Yungtad and Unitar to put all this together. And uh, so we really look forward to, to our further interactions and also cooperation with you, Alex, and with your team. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. All the best to you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. <laughs>